Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for that introduction. Um, uh, just like uh, uh, Dr. Bruton said, um, one of the things that motivated me uh, to think and you know, study in this area of media law and policy was some of the experiences that I went through as a, a news editor, as a producer in broadcasting in Kenya and in Uganda. And uh, one of the things that has been happening over the past several years, especially from 1990 uh, to the present day, is that the media scene in East Africa has been changing. And one of the key things that has been changing is that uh, we have liberalized or privatized the media. Uh, between 1960 um, to around 1990, that was the time when we had um, one, more or less one type of system of, of uh, media. And the media was uh, wholly owned by the government. Now, that was for both Kenya and Uganda. And there were certain constraints that were put on us as uh, uh, broadcasters or even as, as journalists. So today, one of the things that I'm going to be discussing is uh, how has media policy been uh, crafted in East Africa, and particularly in Kenya and Uganda. And I've, I'll be looking at it from a political uh, economy point of view. In other words, I'll be uh, asking who has been involved in crafting the media, for what purpose have they done it, uh, for what, who has been benefiting from uh, the media policy, and then also what effects has that had on the uh, production of programs or even uh, the conduct of journalism in East Africa. And then later on, towards the end of my talk, I'll also give some kind of reflections about um, what's the future uh, and, and what's going on right now. Okay? I would uh, uh, definitely um, appreciate your, um, your participation as we go along. Uh, if there's something I say that's not clear, you know, feel free to interrupt me and, you know, uh, we can discuss it. But uh, very quickly, I'll just introduce you to, you know, Africa, and in particular, East Africa. Um, Kenya and Uganda are right here in the center of, of Africa, or on the east side of, of, uh, of Africa. Um, Kenya, uh, particularly, is a hub uh, for business in uh, Africa. Um, it has a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, um, transnational corporations uh, working there, uh, having businesses there like uh, Coca-Cola. Um, it is also a hub for international organizations, one of them being uh, United Nations Environmental Program. Uh, it has been stable for the last, you know, 40 years, but, um, you know, in comparison to other African countries. So it's, you know, relative uh, stability. Uganda, um, next to it, um, and that's where I actually come from. I come from Uganda, but I've lived in Kenya, and uh, my wife is from Kenya too, so kind of have uh, double nationality, if you want. Um, but uh, Uganda has been, uh, in the last uh, 40 years, and that's uh, from independence, 1960, uh, 62 to you know, the present day, has experienced a lot of uh, political turmoil. And uh, some of you might have heard of Idi Amin, um, you know, uh, some of you might have had even the most recent movie made about, uh, you know, Idi Amin, the last king of Scotland, you know, was about the story in Uganda and what was happening there. Um, so we had a lot of political turmoil, especially in the 60s and in the 70s. And then in 1986, we had uh, a guerrilla movement led by uh, Yorim Seveni, uh, you know, shooting its way into power. And uh, after Museveni came in, you know, there were certain changes uh, that took place in, in government. Um, just to uh, show you some of these uh, people that we are talking about, um, uh, that's um, the picture of, of uh, Museveni, who is the president uh, of Uganda. He's been in power since 1986. Um, initially, of course, since he shot his way into power, um, you know, he's managed to keep himself there. He has had some democratic elections. Um, but at times, uh, it has been, you know, doubtful whether, you know, uh, there were some maneuvers with the, the elections. You know, in his early uh, years, uh, between 1980, 
86 to around 1996, um, his rule was fairly uh, benign, so to speak, in comparison to other uh, African countries. He was uh, hailed as one of the revolutionary leaders, the new breed of leaders in Africa. Okay? And in those first 10 years, you know, a lot of things changed, including uh, the media scene, the media policies in Uganda. Um, then our next door our neighbor in Kenya, uh, the current uh, president of Kenya is Mwai Kibaki. Uh, if we could I just widen that. That's uh, uh, Mwai Kibaki, he's the present uh, president of Kenya. And Mwai Kibaki goes back all the way to the 1960s. Uh, he was one of the people who led the struggle uh, for independence in Kenya. And he later on was a minister in the first uh, uh, post-independence uh, government. And he also became <clears throat> the vice president uh, for several years. And then later on, he became an opposition leader. And um, most recently, in, in 2002, um, after winning elections, he became the president of Kenya. So he's been around uh, for, quite, uh, for quite a while. Okay. Um, so those are some key uh, personalities that we probably uh, need to remember. Uh, this was the president of Kenya just before um, Daniel. Uh, this is Daniel Arap Moy. And he was president um, of Kenya from 1978 uh, to 2002. And, uh, you know, he was a strong man. Um, he really um, changed the face, so to speak, of Kenya. He was there also since independence. He was vice president, um, you know, uh, for several years. And, you know, his rule was also, he was a civilian. Uh, however, some, uh, during some time during his rule, he became kind of you, what you'd call a civilian dictatorship, so to speak. Okay. Um, so much for uh, some of the different uh, leaders in, in Africa. Uh, let's move on to... <clears throat> Okay, let's move on to uh, this. Our topic today is the state of broadcasting in Kenya and Uganda, critical reflections on politics and broadcast uh, policy. Uh, by way of uh, uh, introduction, I'd say that um, <clears throat> there's been a revolution in the, uh, in the industry, the broadcast industry, particularly as far as uh, the regulation of broadcasting is concerned and much more so in terms of uh, opening up space you know, for different people to own media and operate media in East Africa. Um, why do we call this a revolution? It's because between independence, 1960, okay, uh, to around 1990, Kenya and Uganda only had one radio station, one uh, TV station. Now, by one, I mean that it was a government-owned station um, you know, in both Kenya and Uganda. And so in terms of uh, political, um, you know, having different points of views, um, you know, being broadcast over radio or TV, we didn't have that kind of, of luxury, so to speak. Um, it was more or less uh, the media, especially radio or even television, was the voice of the government, okay? Now, around 1989, um, something happened um, you know, worldwide, and that was the fall of uh, the Soviet Union. And with the fall of the Soviet Union, the winds of change that blew over the Eastern Bloc also blew over East Africa. And there was a lot of agitation for change in uh, East Africa and actually the whole of Africa. And because of these, this kind of agitation and this kind of excitement where people were saying, we need better governance, we need a change in the way things are done, there was also pressure to change um, the media and you know, to move away from government-owned or government-controlled media and you know, to release uh, space, to create more space for people to voice their opinions and even you know, to have maybe voices from the opposition. So when we talk about this revolution, we are talking about you know, a time period of now about uh, close to 20 years from you know, 1990 uh, to the present day. Now, one of the things that happened was that 
uh, after 19, um, 1992, and particularly in Uganda, the government uh, liberalized, or even we call it uh, privatized, uh, the media. And one of the things that has happened since then is that we moved from having one uh, radio station to currently 156 uh, radio stations in the country. We've also uh, had a change, even in Kenya, uh, moving from about one radio station to about 60 um, you know, radio stations. Now, this would involve also some, the, we still have government-owned stations, uh, the equivalent of NPR here, you know, what we'd call you know, national public radio. But the difference there is that uh, the government more or less is in, in full control of the content and you know, everything that happens in that station. Okay, now, like I said, we'll be using a political economy perspective, asking questions, who has determined the media policy, uh, why, and who has benefited from it. We've also, uh, we'll be asking questions like, you know, what effect has this had on the industry? Um, we've already looked at uh, the location of, uh, Africa, of Uganda and Kenya. Um, just some uh, data is that Kenya has a population of about 32 million, Uganda 28 million, and uh, one of the most interesting demographics there I would say is the fact that about 85% of the people in Uganda and in Kenya uh, consider radio as the medium of choice, the medium from which they get their information, most of their information. So that's why uh, most of the talk that we'll be having today will be focusing on that fact. You know that uh, radio is a very important uh, medium. Now, there are several uh, different types of media that we have. One of the key uh, groups in East Africa is what we call the Nation Media Group. And the Nation Media Group is a, a transnational um, corporation, so to speak. The Nation Media uh, is owned by the Aga Khan. And the Aga Khan is a leader of the, um, of the Ismaili uh, Muslims in uh, in Pakistan. So um, it's a, an international, uh, uh, is an international business mogul, so to speak. But he has a lot of interests in Africa, especially in development uh, related uh, things. He builds hospitals, builds schools, and so on. But he has also invested heavily in the media. And we are going to see what happens with him uh, as he tries to negotiate uh, for media space in, uh, in East Africa. Uh, we have uh, different, um, uh, these are the websites that we could look at later on. Um, maybe for your interest, you could check those uh, different websites. Um, but let's kind of go back a little bit into the history of uh, broadcasting in Kenya and Uganda. Um, the history of broadcasting in Kenya and Uganda goes back to the colonial times. Uh, Kenya and Uganda were uh, colonized by the British in 1894. Um, Kenya became a British uh, prote protectorate. Uh, while, um, rather, Kenya became a colony, British colony, okay? While Uganda became a British uh, protectorate. Now, that would mean different things. Protectorate means that they would not really tamper with the system of government that was there. Whereas as a colony, it meant that people could settle in, in Kenya and, you know, treat it the way they would treat, you know, Britain and, and so on. Um, but of, over um, the 60 or so years of, of colonialism, um, what happened is that when the, um, broadcasting began here in the U.S., 1920s and so on, also in Kenya, uh, broadcasting began in 1928 with the first radio called Kenya Radio. And the goal of Kenya Radio was to um, actually connect the white settlers who had come to Kenya. And, you know, its main goal was to try and, uh, you know, link up the white settlers, uh, inform them about what was happening in Britain, and, you know, help them to, you know, stay in touch. Um, it, the language that was used, obviously, was English. So the natives or the Africans were not, you know, uh, included in this. So at the very beginnings, um, broadcasting in Kenya, and particularly radio, was meant for the colonizers, so to speak. 
you know, was meant for the foreign powers that had come into the country. Now, with Uganda, we did not have radio until late in the 1940s and, and 50s. And so uh, by that time, th there are certain changes that had started taking place in terms of the agitation for independence and, and so forth. So the story of Uganda is not, uh, per se, as, as interesting as the story of Kenya, the way that uh, when we look back at uh, the history of media policy. Um, one of the things that happened in Kenya was that uh, during World War II, there was a change in terms of media uh, policy and also in terms of media content. And that change was the fact that uh, for the first time, they introduced uh, local languages on Kenya radio. And the reason that uh, local languages were introduced was because um, the British wanted to encourage the Africans you know, to participate in the war effort uh, during the Second World War. And as a result, uh, since they had recruited soldiers from Kenya, or what was then known as the East African you know, uh, King's Battalion, they had to find a way of uh, connecting between the soldiers, you know, getting news from the soldiers on the war front uh, to the people who were back at home. And so that's the way that they came to use radio to try and... Uh, you know, encourage people who had sent their sons and daughters, you know, mostly the, their sons, you know, to go and fight, you know, for the British you know, during the Second World War. So, in a sense, this change in policy was because of interests, you know, of the British. They wanted to recruit um, more people and, you know, encourage them to, you know, um, to fight the war uh, that was going on. However, around 1953, what happened is that, especially in Kenya, there was a rebellion called the Mau Mau Rebellion, where Africans who had gone into, uh, you know, to fight for the British uh, during the Second World War, after they came back home, they started asking questions. You know, we were fighting a war of liberation against uh, Nazism and, and so on, and how come we are still oppressed here? And so it came out of that uh, kind of... Uh, awareness that they started agitating for, for change. And when the Mau Mau rebellion took place in uh, between 1953 up to around 1957 or 58, the British, in order to try and quell the rebellion, started uh, investing more and more in radio and particularly uh, having uh, ethnic broadcasts uh, made in order to kind of uh, quell the rebellion or discourage people from uh, joining uh, this uh, rebellion. However, of course, um, the story is that the British did not, were not able to, um, to quell the rebellion, and in 1963, Kenya uh, became independent. Now, at the time of independence, um, there were several things that were happening in, in Kenya. There was a debate on the use of uh, media and particularly the use of radio. What would happen with radio? Was radio supposed to be, um, you know, how was it going to be used? Who should own the media? And, you know, for what purpose should the media be used? Some of the key things that were happening then or some of the key concerns was that um, since Kenya has about 42 different tribes, radio needs to be used to unite the country. And so a goal of the people who were in power at that time was to try and make sure that radio was a uniting force. The other thing was that um, there was this new thing called, you know, uh, the development paradigm, okay? A paradigm uh, supported by people like uh, uh, Shram and Lerner, where they said that if we um, help developing countries by uh, creating, you know, communication networks, there's going to be a lift in terms of, you know, their development, okay? So the other thing that became very popular was that um, the governments, especially in Africa, started saying, well, let's have uh, media for development purposes, um, broadcasting for development, you know? So that was a, a key thing uh, during that time. Now, the other thing that um, happened during that time, because of this emphasis on unity, there was also suppression of voices. Any other voice that came up and talked about uh, something different, especially criticizing the new government, was, you know, was not allowed at that time. Why? Because we're all trying to pull together and you know, build the nation and, and so forth. 
Now, at that time, there were several um, voices within the government, especially in Kenya, who um, you know, had opposition to this kind of, of, of thinking. Um, one um, member of parliament at that time called Taita Towet, talking about this uh, push to have uh, the media as an arm of the government, said this. I feel the apparent policy of the government, as far as information work in this country is concerned, is to give the people diluted ideas of diluted democratic principles and to stop the people from thinking rightly. The people should be allowed to think as they wish and not to think as the government wants them to think. And, and of course, that's from Heath, uh, 1986. Another uh, opposition politician called Tom Boyer, and uh, this guy was uh, very interesting because not only did he, um, was he in the opposition, uh, later on he got into government and something happened when he got into government. Tom Boyer said this, it's not a matter of saying this is the truth we are telling you. We are the government. You must give them, referring to the people, a chance to decide for themselves whether the government is right or wrong. Otherwise, it's to underestimate the intelligence of the people whom I believe all of us would like to serve. Now, in spite this kind of uh, opposition to uh, having the government controlling the media, uh, the government was able then, uh, the Kanu government was able to go ahead and in 1964 pass a bill which nationalized um, all uh, radio stations, uh, all broadcasting facilities in Kenya. Now, one voice of opposition to that, after that happened, was the voice of Daniel Arap Moy, whom we saw you know, earlier on. And this is what he had to say. He said that, um, <clears throat> let me just hold on a bit there, let me see. Uh, Moy said that, he was concerned that the, uh, with the nationalization of the media, the opposition would be denied a voice and that the voice of Kenya would become a government propaganda tool. So he was concerned about um, you know, what would happen to the opposition. Now, what was interesting at that time, he was a member of the opposition. <clears throat> anyway, to make uh, the long story short, um, later on, nine, a, a few years later, after 1964, Tom Boyer became a minister in the government, <clears throat> you know? And when he became a minister of the government, his tune changed. He started saying that, well, uh, the media is supposed to support government efforts, and the media is supposed to be a voice of the government. And since the government has been elected, the government is the voice of the people. Therefore, the media, being the voice of the government, is also the voice of the people. And anyone who opposes that is probably opposed to the government. Now, that was interesting, coming from somebody who had, a few years before, um, you know, talked about, um, you know, media freedom. Let me just um, highlight this quote. He says... <clears throat> What else do you do with a broadcasting service or information service of the government but propagate government policy and teach people to understand and appreciate the meaning of Kenya's nationhood according to the government's interpretation of it? The government intends to use the voice of Kenya for the purpose of building, strengthening, consolidating the new nation of Kenya and educating its citizens to understand their duties, their responsibilities, their privileges, their opportunities, and the role that they can play in making that nation what all of us would want it to be. It's not intended to be used for the promotion of individual personal ideas. It is intended to be used for the promotion of what is and must be the interest of Kenya. Now that was the opposition leader, now in government, uh, you know, singing <laughs> completely different tune. So that introduced the role, uh, debate about the role of media, the role of broadcasting, and what type of broadcasting system we would have. On one hand, were we going to have a public uh, 
broadcasting um, system based on the public interest? Or were we going to have a public broadcasting system based on public choice? You know? And you know, the variety of uh, um, voices and, and so on. So the 1960s actually set the debate about uh, broadcasting. And as I said earlier on, uh, between 1960 and 1990, we had a uh, hegemony of government uh, ownership of media. Um, <clears throat> over in Uganda, we had a military dictatorship and so on. We had a one-party uh, system of government. And during that time, of course, the media played the role of singing the tune uh, you know, that the government you know, determined. In fact, whenever you'd hear the government spokesman, usually it was the Minister of Information, you know, talking on behalf of, of the government. Okay, very quickly. <clears throat> After 1990, we have what we call the Second Liberation of Africa, or what some scholars have called the Second Liberation Movement. And this was a liberation movement to rid ourselves of bad governance and, and so on. And part of it was because we only had few voices represented in the media. We had few critical voices, especially in broadcasting. Okay? If we go over to the, um, in terms of print media, there was, certain, um, there was some flexibility in terms of print. You know, the governments were not as hard on print. But you would wonder why that was so. The reason being how many people could afford newspapers. And yes, how many people could read anyway? And how many people could read, not just read, but how many could read English? No, so there was that flexibility. Most people uh, could not afford that. Now, during the second liberation, which uh, set up the changes in, in broadcasting, there were not just um, internal pressures, but there were external pressures, especially from the World Bank and IMF you know, international organizations that were involved in, you know, um, giving aid to Africa and so on. Now, the revolution that happened here in the United States, you know, uh, the, you know, in terms of liberalism, in terms of economic liberalism and so on, also reached uh, Africa, where some of these international organizations, especially lending institutions like the World Bank, the IMF, and others, put conditions on African countries that in order for you to have an open market system, a free market economy, you also need to liberalize your media. You need to allow for you know, private ownership of media. We need to have a free flow of information. And in order to have that, you need to allow for people, even uh, you know, country, um, investors from outside, coming in and investing in your media. And that was kind of a precondition for getting aid. And most African governments, including Kenya and Uganda, because of this outside pressure, uh, found themselves having to adjust and having to you know, change uh, the rules as far as the media was concerned. Now, even though those changes took place you know, on paper, and you know, they said, okay, we've liberalized, still there was something that happened that on the ground, there were certain rules that the government uh, um, engaged in which did not necessarily allow for the free flow of information, did not allow for voices of the opposition uh, to be involved in owning uh, the media or even you know, having the expression uh, broadcast um, <clears throat> over radio or even television. There, are also, there was also internal pressure uh, from civic groups especially um, who said, hey, we need a change in the way that we are governed. So what was the government response? The response was that, okay, we shall allow you to have um, media, especially broadcasting. We shall open up. And so they set up regulatory st structures you know, to control uh, the operation of the media. But within these regu regulatory structures, what happened is that we had different types of structures and there was a lot of confusion because it was something kind of that happened overnight. So we had liberalization of the media. We had some um, companies beginning to own radio and TV stations. But there was not a clear uh, policy that was outlined that this is what the media is going to serve. This is what the media is going to do. And for this uh, purpose, 
So as a result, there was a kind of uh, hodgepodge of uh, regulatory bodies that were set up. One of them, for example, in Kenya, was the um, Communications Commission of Kenya. And it was uh, given the responsibility of uh, regulating the media industry, particularly as far as licensing of uh, broadcast stations and so on. Uh, another one was the Ministry of Information and Broadcasting in Kenya. Now, if you wanted to get a broadcast license, you first had to go through the Ministry of Information, and then the Ministry of Information would refer you to the Communications Commission of Kenya, which would uh, find out whether there was frequency, broadcast frequencies that were available. And in order for them to do that, they had to communicate with the Ministry of Transport and Communications, who would then tell you whether you know, there were frequencies. If the Ministry of Transport and Communications said it's okay, we have the frequencies, then you'd go back to the Communications Commission of Kenya, who would say, all right, uh, you've been allocated uh, a license. And then after you've been allocated a license, uh, you'd go to the Ministry of Transport, then they would allocate you a frequency, and then after that, you'd be allowed to operate. Now, what was interesting is that in some cases, some stations would be given the frequency without the license, or they'd be given the license without the frequency. Either way, you would not operate. Okay? And that happened especially to some groups which the government did not want to actually own the media. A case in point is the Nation Media Group that I talked about. You know, they kept tossing them uh, back and forth. And a similar kind of situation happened in Uganda, um, where the government also set up different regulatory structures, sometimes conflicting. In fact, currently what is happening is that we are having a conflict, again, interestingly, with the Nation Media Group where they're trying to set up a, t a TV station in Uganda, but the government you know, does not want them to have it because the nation has tended to be very open to voices from the opposition. And so they're putting up roadblocks for them. Okay, so it's one of the uh, current struggles that uh, the nation media group is, is going through. But the other thing that the government did was to enforce some laws, laws like the law of sedition, the law of libel, um, the law on false information. If you gave information that was not true concerning the operations of the government, you could be taken to court for giving false information. Um, or they invoked what we call the Public Order Security Act. And this was an act that was uh, a remnant of the British. During the time of colonialism, the British introduced this. And you know, this act would allow them to detain you for a certain period of time without trial. And, you know, by enforcing some of these old laws, you know, it kind of frightened the people in the media. You had to treat carefully, you know, lest, uh, you know, you'd end up in prison. Okay. Um, that's kind of a picture, you know, an overview of uh, the different uh, things that have been happening, you know, historically in terms of, of the media. I'll just, um, you know, move on very quickly. Um, I've already talked about the different um, uh, things that happened with uh, um, the different regulatory bodies. But let's talk about the effects. What effects that did liberalization have? It had several effects. There was increased commercial in terms of commercial stations or if you want privately owned stations. Uh, there was an increase in terms of commercials in the programming, you know, which we didn't have before. There was an increase in the diversity of voices and citizens' participation through call-ins and, and so on, uh, which you know, may be a good thing for those who are thinking of having a media that enhances democracy. But there was also an increase in terms of entertainment. Okay? Most of the radio stations that we would have today are kind of entertainment-based. There was also an increase in terms of foreign uh, programming. You know, most of the programming was imported. Um, and, you know, today most of the programs that you'd have here in the U.S., you know, you'd also have, you know, in Uganda and even in Kenya. There's also been an increase in terms of regu re regulatory practices and regulatory bodies, okay? And it seems to be that there's a, a correlation between the time period within which uh, the country 
uh, finds itself and the introduction of new media rules. Most of the rules come about at the time of elections. Whenever elections are on the horizon, the government seem, and this is you know, across the board, both in Kenya and in Uganda, the government suddenly thinks of a new media policy or new media rule that people need to, uh, to follow. Okay? <clears throat> there was also a decrease in education, uh, educational programming, and also informational uh, programming. This was uh, before that, when we had the nationally owned uh, radio and TV stations, uh, there was more uh, educational and informational programming, more programming for children. But now that has kind of you know, receded and given way to economic you know, interests, uh, programming that you know, is more popular, not necessarily programming that may you know, be um, informative. What's the future? Well, the battle continues for media freedom. Um, foreign media ownership is likely to increase in uh, Kenya and Uganda, um, especially, uh, for example, um, I looked up the website of the Kenya Communications uh, Commission. One of the things they encourage investors to invest in Kenya, one of the lines says, um, media ownership in Kenya um, allows for a minimum of 30% local ownership. So you can have 70% foreign ownership. So that's likely to affect um, you know, the way um, we get more investors or the, we may get more people, more foreigners involved in the media in Kenya. Another outgrowth that has happened or development is that we have more community radio stations. However, the problem with community radio stations is the funding. And uh, it's not very easy for community radio stations. In conclusion, uh, politics has actually heavily affected the way that the media operate. It has influenced most of the decisions made about media policy uh, in East Africa, and particularly in Kenya and Uganda. Um, the tyranny of state broadcasting um, is over or is reducing, so to speak. Hopefully, it will soon be over. However, there's the rise of corporate monopoly, one of the key, being, one of the key uh, corporations being the Nation Media Group in East Africa. The Nation Media Group, which I said is owned by the Aga Khan, right now owns radio, TV stations, and also owns uh, the most highly circulated newspaper in the East African region. Um, you know, that's the nation, uh, the daily nation. And so they have concerns or they have a business in Kenya. They have business in, uh, in Uganda. They've started a radio station in Tanzania, which is next door. So they are growing. And, you know, so the concern for transnational corporations and other foreign bodies coming in is, is very high. And finally, um, there's a demand or there's a need for more civil society involvement. Um, media policy has been debated mostly by the people in government, by the people in the opposition, and by the corporations that want to get um, into the media business. But civil society involvement is something that has been lacking. And probably that's the area that um, you know, needs most uh, attention. We need more people agitating for changes in the broadcast media policy. Thank you. <clears throat>